Welcome to this week in Missouri Politics from our Jefferson City Studios here in the state capitol. We are joined by the Attorney General of the State of Missouri, Montgomery County's own Andrew Bailey. Welcome to this week in Missouri Politics. Thanks for having me on, Scott. So you've been in the news lately. I guess when you're AG, the news just finds you, right? <laughs> it seems to. We stay busy. So there's a, the Roe versus Wade decision. You had a tr Missouri had a trigger law in place, outlawed abortion. So the pro-choice crowd has come together with an IP an initiative petition to put it on the ballot, let Missourians vote on what they want the abortion policy of the state to be, go around the legislature, put it in the Constitution. Uh, you've had a little bit of a problem with how they went about it, right? Well, the problem is not with how they've gone about it. The problem is that the Attorney General, along with the Secretary of State and the Auditor, each have a, a part to play in the process. Before the information actually physically goes on the ballot, we have a part to play in that process. And the Attorney General has to approve both the fiscal note and the, the summary ballot summary language as to form and content. And the word content has to mean something. And so I, I understood that to mean that uh, I needed to ensure that the appropriate information was put in front of the voters. And I think that the cost estimate that uh, was submitted was insufficient. Uh, we were challenged on that. We went to court, the Supreme Court has spoken, and it's gone back now to, uh, to the district court level, so we've approved those. But the, there's been a new lawsuit filed that's taken my exact position, which is that, hey, we need to make sure that we're getting all the information possible in front of the voters so that voters can make a good decision at the ballot box. You're the top law enforcement officer in the state of Missouri. I'm just a simple hillbilly. It feels a little bit like maybe, just maybe, you're using the weight of your office to back up your personal conviction. You're very pro-life. I am very pro-life. And it feels like maybe you're giving these folks a skosh more scrutiny than you might your average initiative petition. Doing the job I've been assigned under the statutes as given to us by the people's elected representatives in the General Assembly. And look, I, they're, clearly there are members of the General Assembly who agree with me because they've mm -hmm. carried on this lawsuit now and filed here in, in Cole County Circuit Court claiming that the, the fiscal note summary is insufficient. That Again, we want to make sure that the voters fully understand the cost of these things before they're voting on them. At the end of the day, it feels like they have enough money. At some point, they'll have some ballot language. Whatever the fiscal note is, there's ways to determine these things. It gets, it gets to the ballot. Uh, if that's the case, are you willing to let the people's will stand? Absolutely. The people's will is always going to stand. But personally, I'm pro-life. I think the bill that we have, the, the bill that was signed into law a few years ago, that heartbeat bill, is the right policy position. I'm always going to stand up and fight for life. You know, someone who's adopted children out of the foster system, I know we can find homes for innocent children. And uh, I think that the, the current state of the law allows for an exception when the, the health of the mother's at risk. And so the, the current policy position is codified into law it is the right one. It, uh, it, it's the best uh, policy position to promote the, the safety and health of women and children. So when I hear you talk about abortion, you say it with a different conviction. And I think people may be more open to listen to your message on it. You've actually adopted some children. And to me, that's a it, it almost gives you a little more authoritative stance on talking about these issues than maybe somebody else. Well, Scott, you know, I've, I've adopted children and uh, something I, I don't talk about often, but my wife and I have also lost a biological child. And so when you hold your child in your arms uh, and the, the moments I got to spend with my daughter, I wouldn't trade them for the world. Every life has value. So, but a big case coming up. You got uh, an argument in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, against the Biden administration. Break down what that case is about. Yeah, that's uh, we've uncovered the, the worst First Amendment violations in this nation's history, uh, a relationship of coercion and collusion from the White House across a spectrum of federal bureaucratic agencies with big tech social media corporations to silence Americans' voices in violation of the First Amendment uh, right to free speech. The, the White House, we can show you in, in, in email traffic from March, April, and May of 2021, uh, along with numerous other documents and depositions that uh, the White House was targeting speech. The speech they were targeting was anyone who uh, questioned the effectiveness of vaccines or mask mandates. Uh, they specifically said, take down that Tucker Carlson video, take down that Tommy Lahren post. You know, this is core political speech that's protected by the First Amendment. Let me ask you this. If uh, Elon Musk owns Twitter, Mark Zuckerberg owns Facebook, how's that, if they want to censor speech on their own, I think folks should have the right to know about it, but it's kind of their thing they own. Is the part of this, that, to me, it becomes creepy is when the government gets involved and start telling them what speech to censor. I mean, those folks are their own private business people. The government's paid for by the taxpayers. That, that's a scary thing to me. Yeah, the, the remedy for disfavored speech in this country has always been counter speech, not government yeah. censorship. The whole point of the First Amendment is a free, fair, and open marketplace of ideas uninhibited from government censorship. It's intended to invite dissent so that the people can come to a consensus as to what to believe and what not to believe. Yes, well, let the post dispatch. Every time they wrote a story about you, they give you the, there's a picture of you that looks like you're, you got a stomach ache <laughs> or something. I mean, everybody knows what they're doing. They're yeah. out to make you look as bad as they can. Yeah. And people can read that and know it. And frankly, I think if you're a Republican, you're like, well, he must be doing a good job. If you're a Democrat, you're like, I knew he was awful. But 
when you get the government involved and telling them what picture of you to take and what headline and what story to run, I mean, that's something I don't even think the Post would set well with. These tech companies are a new thing, but by God, they're powerful. Yeah, they, they certainly are. The you know Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act has been misinterpreted by the courts and allowed that big tech monopoly to grow, and it makes the censorship from the federal government that much easier. Look, the founders understood the, the timeless principle behind the right to free speech. It didn't matter in the 1700s, mm -hmm. it was pamphlets. In the 1920s, it was radio. In the 50s, it was television. In the 90s, it was internet. Now it's big tech. And you're absolutely right. The, the medium of communications is not what's relevant. It's, it's the timeless principle of freedom that we have the right to speak freely absent government censorship. So, uh, in result of your case is what? It's already done, right? They've already they tried to keep them doing it again? Yeah, we want to build a wall of separation between tech and state. The first brick of that wall was laid when we won at the U.S. District Court level, and that uh, the preliminary injunction was handed down on July 4th of this year. Uh, that's being appealed to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, so we'll be arguing in the Fifth Cir Circuit in favor of keeping that wall of separation between tech and state in place to protect our constitutional rights to free speech. I mean, why would the government want, I mean, I get, I guess, if you could do it without getting caught, once you've been caught, why would they argue against it? Why wouldn't they want to stay out of that private business and whatever they want to do? Yeah, well, and especially if you read the, the court's 155-page order, again, handed down on July 4th, so I'm you know, flipping burgers and, and yeah. playing with my kids with one hand and, and reading a court order with the other. But in that order, you'll notice that uh, most of the, the document is just a recitation, a recounting, an enumeration of the evidence that we put on at the, the hearing on the prelim preliminary injunction, so the evidence we adduced. Only a small portion is the actual order, but all the court is saying is that the federal government can't violate the First Amendment. What was there to appeal, yeah. uh, to your point? So uh, it's all about student loans. Yeah. Uh, former Attorney General Schmidt filed something. You've taken it up with gusto and ran it all the way through, and you, you end up winning, right? Yep. Yeah, I got to sit at council table at the United States Supreme Court and represent the people What's of the state of Missouri. Like? You're it's a guy from Montgomery County. It's humbling, man. Farm boy. Yeah, you're yeah. sitting at the argument case in the United States Supreme Court. That's going to be almost a surreal experience. Look around that room. Yeah, I felt like I was a long way from Montgomery City for sure. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, you know, it's it's just a humbling experience to get to do that. But we're not going to let Joe Biden saddle working Missouri families with Ivy League debt. You know, someone who went to college on the ROTC scholarship and served my nation and paid for law school with the post 9/11 GI Bill. That one was personal for me, and that would have cost the Missouri taxpayers 44 million dollars almost a quarter, excuse me, almost a half trillion dollars nationwide. And so clearly uh, Joe Biden didn't have the constitutional authority to do that. But to me, if you want to cancel student debt, okay, fine. There's people that believe that, argue for that. I'm more in line with you. Uh, those Ivy League boys, can, their daddies can pay for their own college. But I, I do think if, if you want to make that a government policy, there's a means to do that. It's the United States Congress and That's the right. president has a role in it. Then you can take the course and challenge it. I thought your argument was very good. You can't just do it on your own. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look, Joe Biden knew that. He tried to get a bill through Congress. He couldn't do it. And yeah. after he failed, that's when he tried to use uh, regulatory overreach to get it done. And we had to hold him accountable. And we're, luckily, we prevailed and, uh, again, saved uh, Missouri taxpayers and working Missouri families from having to foot the bill. Just something right about an old boy goes to Missouri State and gets him a degree and has to work 20 years to pay it off. And then somebody at Harvard just gets a free ride. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it... it, it it uh, it offends our basic sense of fairness. It's uh, you know it's, it doesn't doesn't comport with kind of a basic responsibility and accountability that we hold dear here in our, our American system. But uh, it was also unconstitutional and illegal. Uh, looking on, there's something that that it's so funny. I watched all the rejoicing and the the. I mean, it would have rivaled Palm Sunday when Kim Gardner resigned. <laughs> Folks taking credit, patting themselves on the back, new day. And I assume the new gentleman's probably off to a pretty good start. Uh, but you're the one that stepped up with this quo warranto. I'm probably, my hillbilly dialect may say that incorrectly. Um, when you filed that, that's what actually started the domino effect of Kim Gardner leaving office. Yeah. Yeah, look, safer streets equal prosperous communities. We were going to enforce the rule of law and find justice for victims. My heart goes out to all those people who, you know, were harmed by a criminal behavior in the city of St. Louis and never got their day in court because she wouldn't take the cases to trial. She wouldn't file new cases. 96% of crimes reported in the city of St. Louis did not result in criminal charges being filed by her office. That's an incredible, uh, unlawful uh, refusal to do her job. And, and I think, look, you know, people have their own opinions on Kim. I do think even her supporters knew that maybe the situation had gotten, they may have different people to blame for it, they may have a different view of the facts. I think even our supporters had come to the point of, okay, there's something not right here. Some, something's not going well. And I think maybe she must have known that too when she stepped aside, but I don't think any of that would happen without you filing the case you filed, that nobody else had taken the, the gumption to file. 
A lot of folks said, oh, this won't work. I remember people coming to my show and saying, this is just some attention getting thing. Well, then the day was probably the most impactful thing in St. Louis law enforcement in the last 10 years. Yeah, and I, you know, I think about those men and women in uniform and law enforcement who put their lives on the line every day uh, to keep the rest of us safe and ensure that our safer streets equal prosperous communities. And when she wasn't looking at the police reports they're sending them or you know, working to keep the bad guys away that they locked up, that's, uh, that's a deplorable, unlawful re refusal to do her job. And we were going to hold her accountable. When I came to office back in January, we knew we had to get violent crime in St. Louis under control. And we, it took us less than 60 days to realize that the Quo Moranto was the best mechanism to do that and to get her out of office so we could start the rebuild and, again, restore the rule it's not just law. that. I mean, St. Louis has been what we would consider in Stringtown, Missouri, dangerous my entire life, long before Kim Gardner was prosecutor. It's more than just her, right? Yeah, I mean, look, there, there's some uh, structural changes that need to take place. I don't think we can go back to the status quo. The status quo has failed us. Uh, we've got to take a hard look at what went wrong here and what systems need to be put in place to prevent it from ever happening again. At some point uh, in, the, in the coming months, I'm going to publish a Gardner report that's going to put the evidence out there and, and recommendations and, and lessons learned from our experience and the, the lawsuit that we filed to have her removed. So, end of the day, I mean, everybody talks about more cops, probably better than less cops, right? But, you know, part of this is where you have poverty, you have crime. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and part of it is where you have a lot of guns, it's, it's a little more dangerous than when you I guess in Montgomery County, there's a lot of guns and it's not dangerous at all, so maybe that's different. But uh, what do you say to someone like Mayor Jones, who, who did, at the end of the day, step up and express some concerns, which I know was not easy for her? Wouldn't be, it would be, wouldn't be easy for you taking a guy that was in your office that gets in the state legislature and you having to say, well, I'm not sure he's doing a good job. But she says guns. What do you say to, to a person who is a serious person who says, if you don't address gun crime, we can't get this solved? Well, and I, I think that the distinction there is gun crime from lawful gun owners. Guns aren't the problem. The criminals are the problem. So what are we doing to hold the criminals accountable? There are ample tools on the books now to hold wrongdoers accountable and make sure that the bad guys are off the streets. And it, it is an economic issue. It's absolutely uh, you know, devastating to economic development uh, when you have rampant crime like that. 542 businesses had left downtown St. Louis because Kim Gardner was refusing to do her job. So it, it is the, the two things are intertwined completely. You know, again, that's why I say safer streets equal prosperous communities. You get crime under control. It's the lost opportunity for the people in the city of St. Louis. They're the ones that were hurt. It was Kim Gardner's own constituents that you know have fewer jobs, fewer opportunities because those businesses left. Let's talk uh, where, where you go. Uh, you were one of the first folks to, to endorse Donald Trump. One of the first state officials I saw endorse Donald Trump. Period. Uh, it feels like uh, maybe Donald Trump finds himself into some shenanigans. But I have a hard time just in my, I mean, I can get a little Donald Trump fatigue. But when they arrest him every day for something, I'm like, now come on. It just kind of feels like you're using the office to get your name in the paper, using the office to, uh, to, to prosecute a guy because of his political beliefs. I mean, I think if Roger, Roger Stone would never have been charged with anything if Donald Trump wouldn't have won. The other guy is, I don't think, I think the, the if you want to call it a deep state, they went after these guys because he won. They hated him. Yeah. And it feels like now, like, Paying off that gal in New York, I'm sorry, that doesn't feel like a crime. It looks like you want to persecute a guy because he won an election. Yeah. Look, Donald Trump is a proven leader who delivered positive results for the American people, and the left hates him for it. And we have a two-tiered system of justice at the federal level at this point. Look at how they protect Hunter Biden. Look at how they protect, protected Hillary Clinton. Look at how they suppressed the Hunter Biden laptop story, evidence that we've uncovered in Missouri v. Biden, our First Amendment suit. Clearly, the Department of Justice has been weaponized against conservatives and specifically targeting Donald Trump. I mean, you can see a lot of similarities into what's going on with Donald Trump and, and again, the, the weaponization of the Department of Justice that we can demonstrate in that First Amendment lawsuit. You're the chief law enforcement officer of the state of Missouri. I'm sure there's times that you have to sit and balance a test out and say, is this worth doing? Is this, is this political? Is the guy doing it, bringing it political? Those are tough judgments. It feels like if you're a Democrat right now and you want to move up in your career, you charge Donald Trump with something. It has the it has the um, it has the tay it has the look to me as a person that I look I like Trump I, I I totally get Trump's appeal I get a little tired of Trump sometimes acting clownish but now it kind of takes me in like well you know what if you're going to be after him I want to vote for him you know what I mean there is a fine line there I'm sure someone has to look at that how do you deal with those issues of okay maybe this is political maybe this isn't the pressing need of the office yeah well. I'm going to always do the right things for the right reasons to protect Missourians and our constitutional rights. I wish that our colleagues at the federal level felt the same way. 
Clearly, they have weaponized the federal government to push a, a woke left-wing ideology through these unelected federal bureaucrats to silence our voices in, in violation of the First Amendment, as we've demonstrated in Missouri v. Biden, to go after our political heroes like our president, uh, Donald Trump. I mean, this is deplorable behavior on an unprecedented scale. And instead of doing the things they're supposed to be doing, like securing our southern border to stop fentanyl and human trafficking, things that are making Missouri communities less safe, they're telling us which stoves we can and can't use. And like you said, trying to arrest Donald Trump every week. Well, Attorney General Andrew Bates, thank you for the time. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Scott. Appreciate you. We'll be right back with our opinion maker panel. Rudy Veed will be on. But first, showmissouri.com. This is Missouri One County Time. This time we're in St. Charles. Old buddy Steve Elm and Wendy Hossman talking all things from where he says the real launch of the Lewis and Clark expedition was to the wars, the floods, everything you want to know about St. Charles County. Showmissouri.com. This is County. This is Missouri One County Time. We'll be right back after this. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right-to-work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Thanks for joining us. Justice and Journalism with Judge Mike Carter. What I'd like to do is bring facts and circumstances from around the metro area with some local politicos, charitable causes, and let you decide for yourself if you like what's going on. I'm in this for public service. 400 qualified jurors in some of the rural counties are actually really hard to find. When you're talking about low-level, nonviolent offenders, when you put them in jail, you increase the likelihood that they turn into a serious offender. Justice and Journalism with me, Judge Mike Carter. Starting with just $300 to his name, Vivek Malik has never stopped working and has risen to become Missouri's state treasurer. Vivek Malik never forgets our duty to keep the American dream alive. This is the greatest country in the world. There's a lot that divides us, but the one thing that unites us all is our love for this great country. Vivek Malik, treasuring what we hold most dear. Data captured by our state-of-the-art monitors helps us pinpoint the timing and location of severe weather more accurately and respond to trouble more quickly. Ameren, Missouri's investment in smart technologies like this is one way we're improving reliability and restoring power faster than ever. Responding to trouble before trouble hits. That's energy at work. Ameren, Missouri. Welcome back to Week in Missouri Politics. Opinion Maker Panel Time. Representative Rudy V. Cole County's own. Thank you for making the time. Yeah, honor to be here and a pleasure. It's always great to listen to you and the morning show also. Oh, more, speaking of the morning show, Stephanie Bell. The morning show in Columbia. Older woman, lawyer, trolley company. Right. There's got to be more, I feel like. There probably is. But well, how I'm, about a mother? Mother. Mother. <laughs> most importantly. Celebrating a birthday. Coming up 29th soon. 29th birthday. That's exactly right. But, you know, I love when you are able to join us on Wake Up Mid-Missouri. Glad to be here today with you. So fun. Tony Herman, KRMS Radio. Thank you for making the time, sir. Yeah, appreciate the opportunity to come on the show and talk. Uh, you guys passed a bill in legislation that said if Roe versus Wade's ever overturned, abortion is totally, totally legal in the state of Missouri. Uh, I don't know that you really thought it would be overturned when you passed it, but it got overturned and now it's totally legal. Now your pro-choice folks are coming back and want to put it on the ballot. To put it in the Constitution, you have a right to an abortion. Uh, I do think maybe your Secretary of State and your Attorney General, they have very thoroughly done their jobs on this, right? Some would say give them a hard time, some would say very thoroughly doing them. Well, they truly believe and are opposed to abortion. Those that are very much in favor of abortion will go to their extremes to get their goals across too. And that's what we have a court system for, where those different things can be heard and resolved. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a personal belief of theirs, and, and they strongly believe about it, so they're both fighting for their own what they truly believe. I think that's a nice summation of it. I do think they're probably giving these uh, pro-abortion folks a little harder time than uh, they might otherwise, right? I think they are making it very difficult. I yeah. think they are running towards their base right now with the, the elections in mind coming up as well. I do believe they are pro-life, but I think they are they're making sure every T is crossed and every I is dotted. So you are your attorney, it does feel as though they're being very, very thorough in making sure this initiative petition gets all the attention it deserves. I think they both take their jobs very seriously, but I would encourage people who are characterizing their ballot title as extreme, go read the text of the actual measure. Unlike past measures where people complained that it was too many pages, 
a lot of, there's various versions filed, but most of them are just a single page. And it uses terms like reproductive freedom and the words abortion care. And so any characterization that the ballot title is extreme, the language of the initiative is extreme. Interesting. Uh, so now we have an AG race. Some would say these two things could be a touch connected. Uh, Rudy Veet, you, you probably know both these folks. They're both attorneys. Will Sharp running on the Republican side. The current attorney general is running for election. Uh, I would say Andrew Bailey, what he's doing now, no one that would vote for him is going to be too put out with him for giving the abortion IP a hard way to go, right? No, those who vote for him and, and that line of people are, are not are not going to hold that against him. Some of the others might, but you have two qualified, highly qualified candidates in both of them, and there's more to than just abortion that we're going to have to deal with yep. over time. But that is a number one priority for a lot of people. These are two people you know very well. Summarize the race. Well, I am firmly in uh, Camp Bailey right now. Uh, I have a connection with the campaign. And, um, but I think uh, Attorney General Bailey is doing a great job. And I think, you know, beyond abortion, if you look at him picking up where Eric Schmidt left off with fighting the Biden mm -hmm. administration, I think he's seen a lot of success. And actually winning. And winning, seeing success there, and then also leading the nation. Missouri is among the leading states on some of these fights, and we've really gotten a lot of positive uh, press for Missouri out of those fights against the Biden administration. Lots of folk mo folks mocked Eric Schmidt, pursuing everybody and what have you. But you're seeing as these cases get adjudicated, some of these he's actually taking to trial. Some of these he's actually winning. Yeah. I guess under a general Bailey, but I mean, these things take time, right? They do take time. Uh, both candidates qualified to do the job, both very intelligent guys. You got one of the Montgomery County war hero, mm -hmm. uh, Will Sharf, Ivy League educated, very intelligent, got a lot of money behind him. Uh, how's that going to break down at the lake? You know, both are strong candidates. Both are strong candidates. Both are well qualified for the position. Missouri is in a good spot this election because from the top of the ticket all the way to the bottom, there are strong candidates in every race. I think uh, I, I think you give the current AG the nod right now because of this. What does scare me, or not scare me, but what I do think is a concern for the AG is this issue of abortion has created a lot of one issue voters out there and that could be a, a, a problem for the Republicans. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, talk about this governor's race, Rudy Veed. You've got a, a guy from your neck of the woods running for governor, Mike Kehoe, state senator here for a long time, lieutenant governor, Bill Eigel, Jay Ashcroft, graduated uh, high school here in Jeff City. Uh, what does folks in Cole County think? They, they know two of these guys pretty well. <clears throat> well, I mean, my position is kind of biased in that I've been in business with, with Representative, I mean, with uh, Lieutenant Governor Keyhole. He has purchased my nieces and nephews hams and, and steers and you name it. My brother in law has worked there for a number of years. He gave, made him a good living. So I'm kind of biased, but I've also been in Ashcroft's office. But I mean, in a rural area, I think the vote there is certainly in this area, it's, it's Mike Keyhole. There is a, a real, if you meet Mike Keyhole, boy, it's darn hard not to respect him and like him. He can relate to people. He comes around. He's at the functions. He's at the fairs. He's he's dealt with people his whole life in sales. And you know, you don't sell cars and run a business without being kind of a people person. And that's what he is. Tell you me know, about the, you 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 observe these guys from the media. Tell me how folks at Lake think. You know, at the lake, Mike Kehoe just down there last week, very favorable. Uh, very maroon county, Camden County. I would say Jay Ashcroft. Uh, would take the, the lead right now in our count county. Very interesting race as Kehoe brings in the big money donors as he's ahead in donations, uh, contributions, but Ashcroft seems to lead in the majority of polls. Well, I think you've got that name, right? I mean, I that, mean what do you, what do you, and, and while, you know, it's, it's not fair to say he's just a name, I mean, he's won statewide election twice in his mm -hmm. own merit, but I mean, that does give you a huge advantage, right? I think it does. And when you look at four counties out of 115 last year went uh, Democrat, I, I think with the majority of the other 111 voting Republican, you get out into those rural areas, I think the Ashcroft name does carry that weight. I mean, I think anybody in this state, whether you were in politics, media, whatever, you've heard the name Ashcroft. I mean, the man served this state very admirably, very, very well known. But Bill Eichel, I think folks may be selling Bill a little short here. I, it has been a long time since Phil Donnelly left the state Senate to go to the governor's mansion. But I do think Bill Eichel is probably the best orator in the party. He is raising money. The guy knows how to campaign. He has he has basically figured out how to connect with that suburban ticked off guy. And he knows how to talk to that guy. I, I disagree. I don't think people are underestimating him. I think if we look at Kehoe, um, I think 
I, I think we're right. I think what was said earlier is right, that if we start focusing on the abortion issue and let that become the main issue, that Republicans might be in trouble. And I think with Kehoe, we get someone who's more focused on business and economics and how mm -hmm. to bring our state forward. And I personally would like to see the race geared more out of the cultural issues and more towards the economy. And I think Mike Kehoe is someone who can make the race about the economy. And I think if I'm talking to my friends and my neighbors and my folks in Ashland and I'm at the rodeo, what are they concerned about? Are they concerned about abortion or are they concerned about the price of gas, the price of groceries, their own small businesses, employment, workforce? I think those All are right. the issues that are important. So uh, before we go, we got to talk with Trump. Uh, 70 billion, they, it just feels to me like, yeah, I mean, Trump acts like a jerk, right? I get it. But they're arresting him every other day now. I get a little tired of Trump sometimes, but now I'm like, you know what? That's not right. I mean, we like to say on the show he could tear a tag off a mattress and get indicted. I mean, they really, I have Trump indictment fatigue syndrome, if that's actually a thing. I'm just tired of talking about it, and I think most people are. I think they're ready to move on. Um, you know, but he's pulling the ultimate troll at the Iowa State Fair, apparently taking a bunch of Florida legislators with him. Um, and so you have to respect him. I like stuff like that. The white trash should be likes that. <laughs> Rudy Veet, I tell you, I kind of get tired of Trump and him whining about the election that he lost. But when they start arresting him every other day for stuff, I'm like, you know what? Well, this is ridiculous. I like him again. Certain number of people are saying, well, he should be treated like everybody else. But others, you know, he's not treated like everybody no, else. No, he, he's being treated. And people are going to be, by the election time, they're going to be so tired of it. But my concern is more selfish. What is he going to do to the Republican Party? If he's a nominee, what happens? You know, I have more selfish I don't think what... he, can, he can't win a national election, I doubt. But they keep picking on him. You're going to see that ticked off. I mean, he, it looks, if they had just left him to his own devices, I don't think Trump would be the nominee. But, and then maybe that's what they want. But when you have every Democrat in the country charging him with a crime, I'm like, come on, this is ridiculous. Uh, former president tends not to focus on the four to 8% that elects presidents in this country. He doesn't focus on that independent voter. He consistently rallies his base, which you have to do as well. But I do believe, I do believe people are tired of the indictment thing. If you look, yeah. the, first, the first time he was indicted, there were parades of people up and down the streets. Last time, Five guys holding a sign. Well, we're about to get into that if we don't get off there. So tell me, Rudy V, who won the week? I think probably the Jefferson City School District was starting a STEM school for our students this year in Jefferson City. Nice. Congratulations. One week. I think anyone who wanted to get an issue done next session that's not initiative petition reform, we heard that that issue might be off the table next year after what happened in Ohio. And so I think if you've got another issue like education reform, child care, you won the week. One week. I think this is a good week for Crystal Quaid. I think this shows, Ohio shows that, which is a reflection of Missouri, that the abortion issue is much more on people's minds than what we thought. And it may show, although a narrow path, there may be a path for her to the governorship. And I'll tell you, if, if you don't know, if you don't know Crystal Quaid, you're hearing about her, go back and folks listen to the interview you did with her. I thought that was a very good interview where it talked about where she was. She no secret about where her positions are, mm -hmm. but it was a respectful conversation I really enjoyed. Very honest. She's very yes. honest. She, she shares her opinions and, uh, I enjoyed the conversation with her. I'm going to say the new city administrator here in Jefferson City, Brian Crane. I think he's in very good hands with Missouri's mayor, Ron Fitzwater, and now bringing in a good lieutenant to the city. Hope you'll win the week next week by joining us from the State Fair in Sedalia, Governor Mike Parson, next week on This Week in Missouri Politics. This Week in Missouri Politics is sponsored by the Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, Ameren, Spire, and the United Electric Cooperative. Oh,